Hey everyone, this is Bathmetrics, and today I'm doing a follow-up to a video I put out two days ago talking about um, how to do hocketing with uh, selector devices in Bitwig. Um, Mr. Bill had done a, a good tutorial on the concept of hocketing and showed the, the workaround kind of techniques he uses to do it in Ableton Live. And since Bitwig has a couple first-class devices that make hocketing really, really simple, I thought it'd be fun to put out a video showing how Bitwig does it. And somebody asked a really good question in this video because Bitwig, by default, uh, in any of its um, selector devices, like the instrument selector we use to do the hocketing technique, the thing about Bitwig is by design, every layer and an instrument selector will ring out its decay tail when you switch to any other layer. So for example, if it was playing this layer and then it switches to one of the other layers, if there's any sort of reverb or decay or any kind of tail that was still happening in this layer at the time you switch to a different layer, it's gonna fully let it ring out, which Ableton doesn't do. Uh, it's something machine does. If you've ever tried pulling uh, stems and loops out of machine and bringing them into your project, you've, you've undoubtedly had to wrestle with all the tails that come out uh, from the way machine works. And, and Bitwig is the same way. And most of the time you want that behavior because it sounds much more natural and smoother. Uh, if there's a little bit of a last minute decay on something, you want that in most cases. But as with everything, uh, especially with more aggressive types of electronic dance music, um, Sometimes you want a much harder gated kind of switching and swapping. You want to really have a vertical feeling and just abruptly stop one sound and instantly start another sound. And Ableton does that by default. It doesn't do the gating very well. Um, but in Bitwig, you have the opposite problem. What if you want gating? So someone asked me, how do you do gating in Bitwig? And that's what this video is going to be about. So this is like a, a follow-on video to uh, this this number 24 in my series. Okay, so here's the basic problem. We have tails, but let's say for whatever reason we don't want tails. There's a couple ways you can do it, and ultimately the best way is to use the newest version of Bitwig that's coming out soon, that's still in beta. It's Bitwig 3.0. I'm currently demoing this to you in the beta 5 client, which is the, the current beta. I think we're pretty close to release, but um, you never know with these things. But I have a feeling this will be ready, I'm going to guess, within the next month. This is going to be widely available, and this will be something you can take advantage of in Bitwig. We're going to use the new grid devices to solve the problem in the best way possible. But let me show you the one way you can solve it today in Bitwig 2.5. So here's the problem. Uh, if we have a hocket that is tailing out. So we have three sounds here. And let me mute these and unmute these correctly. So this is the hocket with the tails. And this time, instead of using track automation to switch between the layers, I just have a simple uh, random modulator that's just randomly uh, delivering unipolar values between 0 and 100. And it's modulating the index selector here. You can see these little blue dots. That's the third layer, second layer, and when there's no dots, it's the first layer, okay? Uh, so this is what it sounds like with tails, these three sounds I have in this hocket. Okay, so it's hocketing on every two beats, every half bar. And you can see that, you know, when a sound stops, it takes a while for its signal to fall down. So there's definitely a reverb tail or, or decay tail on any one of these layers. One more time. Okay, so what if you don't want that? Well, in 2.5, there's one answer if you're in the current version of Bitwig. And we're gonna do that by going back to good old automation. 
and I'm gonna unfold these automation tracks and show you what we have here. So here, I'm not using a random modulator, and I've only got two sounds, just to keep it simple. Uh, instead, I'm modulating between the two layers with this lane right here, which is just, you know, every two bar, every two beats, it's swapping between either layer two or layer one, okay? And then the way you would uh, gate these tails and prevent them from ringing out is simply by taking the, the fader that's on each layer here, this little brown slider thingy, and just cramming it down to the bottom really fast to instantly gate it. Uh, so I'm using these two automation lanes to do that. And you know this automation lane is affecting the first fader. This automation lane is affecting the second fader. And it's just flopping between negative infinity and zero dB. Uh, on each layer to match the hocketing layer. Okay, so it works, but it's a little, you know, it takes time to set up automation. That's why we like modulation and why we like Bitwig, because you can do a lot of good things through modulation instead of having to draw out automation. But this is, this is the only way you could really pull it off in Bitwig 2.5, and here's what it sounds like with these two sounds. Whoops, let's make sure we're listening to the right one. And if you watch here, these are a little obscured by the blue marker showing there's some automation attached to them, but you'll see the, the orange bar snap to the bottom really quick long before the, the tail of the sound on the channel finishes its decay. Okay, so that's what we want to achieve to create the gated hocketing. Uh, there's no way in 2.5 to use modulators of any sort. You know, all of Bitwig's great modulators like random or LFOs or sample and hold or steps or any of those things. You can't use these and also have the automation, I'm sorry, the modulation from one of these modulators. You can't, you can't, <laughs> You can't really modulate this and these effectively with the same exact modulator, which is the ideal case. Uh, and it just has to do with the fact that this is a integer value from zero to one to two to three to four to switch between these layers. And these are continuous values. And so I tried every workaround I could think of. I tried every creative trick in the book, you know, from using note gates, MIDI note gates, to using note replacer devices, to just, I, I tried everything, and there's just no way to really snap these faders from, you know, zero to negative infinity back and forth. There's no way to snap them exactly at the same moment as the automation is, I'm sorry, at the same moment as the modulation is swapping the uh, index around, okay? Now in 3.0, we can do this. So that's what I'm gonna show you because pretty soon it's all gonna be moot. In fact, if you're watching this video now, 3.0 may already be out. So here's how we do it in 3.0. And we do it by using one of the new grid devices. So if this is the first time you're seeing the grid, it's just flat out amazing. You're gonna love it. Ableton has absolutely nothing like it. Max for Live cannot even come close to this thing. Um, it's the th the big difference between Bitwig's grid and something like Reactor or any of the other third-party modular software systems, or certainly different than Max for Live or or Max proper, is that this is incredibly friendly to people who don't know the first thing about modular stuff. I mean, it uses a lot of terms and ideas from the modular world. We have the notion of gates, we have the notion of phase. Um, but once you learn a few basics about what the hell is phase <laughs> and, and what's the difference between phase and, and a, a regular you know, audio signal, uh, and once you learn a little bit about the concept of the difference between data signals and audio signals, and once you learn just a few basic, simple, simple concepts about logic and how to do logic tests and logic triggers, like we've got Boolean logic triggers, we have math comparators, um, 
We have mathematic transforms that can do all sorts of useful transforms. And this is, this is all stuff from the modular world, but I, I don't own a modular system. I look at a modular rack and I just cringe. I, I am not the type of person that would look at any module on a piece of modular hardware and, and know how to start, right? And yet, I wrapped my head around the grid really fast because the way that they built this, the usability, the workflow, um, is just amazing. And they have some amazing oscillators in here too for generating new sounds like the swarm oscillator is just amazing. They've got their entire sampler in here, so you can do granular synthesis, wavetable synthesis, and just using samples as well as, you know, these other types of more analog uh, oscillators. Uh, they've got inputs and outputs for pretty much everything you could want, including the ability to do <clears throat> uh, send modulators as an output. So I'm not going to go into a big tour about the grid. I'm just kind of showing you briefly what it's about. If this is the first time you've ever seen it, it's amazing. So in this case, I'm using the grid as a, as a modular novice who doesn't know much about modular. I'm using it to solve a problem. And that problem is very simply that I want whatever modulation is flipping the index around to do my hocketing, I want that same modulation to instantly snap these layer faders between negative infinity and zero dB. I want the same exact trigger to happen to both of these things at the same time. And that's an easy problem to solve with the grid. So let's give you uh, the bigger picture here of how these grid devices work. We'll come back to this one in a second. There are two types of grid devices so far. We have what's called an FX grid and a poly grid. One of them's made to be ideally generating sounds. And the other one is made to be processing audio. So let's just show you what these look like side by side. The only real difference between them is that the FX grid doesn't have an output level, right? Instead, it has a mix knob. So it's meant to mix between whatever FX processing you've built up inside the grid. It's meant to mix that in a parallel way with your audio signal that's running through it. And inside the audio grid, you start with an audio input and an audio output, and all the lines and signal connections in Bitwig are stereo. So this is a stereo left-right signal moving through here. And then you would just take different devices and build up your, your processing effect inside here. So that's what an FX grid normally looks like. A poly grid normally starts with an oscillator of some sort, in this case a simple triangle, an envelope of some sort, and an audio output. So this is meant to generate sound. And this right here is a gate signal, which means it's waiting for some sort of keyboard key to be held down or gated with incoming notes. And then that'll trigger the envelope. This oscillator is always running and always generating a signal. This, the envelope is gating the signal. So this is your basic simplest form of, of any kind of uh, synthesizer that's being built up in the polygrid. So, to solve the problem I want to solve, uh, I don't want to generate the sounds inside of a grid. I want to use a uh, regular instrument selector and synths of my choice. Like in this case, these are all FM4 polysynth, which are Bitwig instruments, but they could be Serum, they could be Avenger, they could be Thorn, they could be any Hive, Zebra, whatever, whatever type of synth you want. Um, so, Let's get rid of these so they're not confusing. All right, so the way you would do this, the way you would approach the problem I want to solve is you'd put your instrument selector inside of one of the containers of an FX device, an FX grid. And the difference here is any, any kind of VSTs or plugins or devices you put in the pre-FX container will take effect before the grid is applied, anything inside the grid. And then the post effects takes place on whatever sound is coming out of the grid, right? So you can do pre-processing and post-processing of whatever you've built up inside the grid. In this case, it doesn't matter because what I'm really doing is I'm not running audio signal through the grid. Instead, I'm using uh, a couple LFO devices to generate some kind of signal. And then I'm acting on those signals and then uh, 
in a couple places you'll see I have these output modulators, like a whole string of them here on, on these things, and then this one right here. And these output modulators are modulating various things down here in my internal device that's inside the grid device, okay? So the way the grid works is any kind of connection, especially these wireless modular modulator connections, anything inside the grid can talk to anything outside of the grid as long as it's in one of the grid device's two containers, and vice versa. Any kind of modulator I might put here, like a macro knob, I could easily take this modulator and hook it up to anything inside of the grid as well as hooking this modulator up to any child device or plugin that's inside the container. So again, the Bitwig way is to be very, very, very modular and anything can connect to anything and you can route and patch almost anything to almost anything anywhere else. And the grid devices are no exception. So with that basic preamble, Let's talk about what this particular grid device is doing to solve our problem. Um, I also like that the grid lets you put up colorful uh, labels and blocks that you can put comments in to explain what's happening. It's got uh, a lot of really good visual feedback devices like oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers and value readouts, which I'm using a couple value readouts in this one. Uh, it's just really great for like, you can build something complex and then actually document it inside the build, which is much, much harder to do in something like Reactor uh, and certainly in something like Max for Live. So you can build something kind of complex and come back to it four months later or hand it to somebody else and say, here, check out this, this grid device I, I made. And if you do a good job of explaining what's going on inside the grid device, somebody else can pick it up quickly or you can remember what you built uh, half a year ago, which is often problematic with stuff like this. So what I'm doing here is very simple. I want the hocketing to happen on the basis of beats and bars or, or specific note lengths. So the very first thing I'm using is a modulator type called transport. Transport is in the, where are you guys, where are you guys? Random, I always forget where these things are. No, 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 no. Data, no. Oh, come on, where are you? Is it an oscillator? No. Sorry, I should have, I should have looked for this beforehand. You're here somewhere, you're here somewhere. Modulator, I'm sorry. Uh, transport, transport, it's mix, isn't it? Transport, transport, you're not logic, you're not math. Pitch, no, level, god damn it. <laughs> Sorry about this. Where are you, transport? There you are, you're in LFO, okay. So I, I was looking for modulator, but the keyword is LFO. So they have your standard LFO types, they have a clock LFO or modulator, and then they have this transport modulator. So what this does is it's saying, you know, when the transport is plain, let's subdivide it. And you can subdivide it by any value you want. It could be 1, 2, 4, 16, 32, whatever for, you know, whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, etc. So in this case, it's subdivided by 16th notes. <clears throat> and I'm saying every 8 16th notes, I want you to output a, um, a trigger signal. And that's what this yellow line represents. And you can actually see it here if I play this. Oh, and let's make sure I've got the right track. Unmuted, okay, right, that's the right one. So every, every two beats in a bar, every half note, I want you to output a clock signal and they have these little internal um, graphs that show what's happening. So there's one, two, three, so this purple thing showing the phase from like, you know, the start of, of the bar and then every half, every half note, every two beats, every eight to 16th notes, this phase rolls to the top and then it drops to the bottom again saying, now we're starting the next two beats and it pumps out a logic signal, which is the yellow block. Okay, so that yellow signal 
is then triggering that that trigger is triggering this dice um, module, which is just generating a random value between uh, zero and one. It's a unipolar signal, so zero to one, not negative one to negative one, which would be bipolar. Um, so what we're basically saying here is just every two beats, generate a new random value between zero to 100%, okay? Then uh, we have to tell, to, to quantize that and, and have this understand how to slice and change the, the index, the selector index of the select, selector device. We need to tell it how many layers are in the selector device. So I'm using three layers, so I specify a constant of three here. So then here in this section, we're just doing a little math to cleanly quantize or divvy up that zero to 100 range into three ranges. So we just take this number of layers and divide it by one. That's what this divide operator is doing. And then we run it through a quantizer. And that's basically going to always take this, whatever random dice roll between zero to 100 is, it switches it into three possible values, zero, point three, 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 whatever, and 0 0.66666, whatever. In other words, it divides it into thirds, okay? If I were to change this, um, and if you watch here, this is the actual value that's output by the quantizer. You're gonna see it bounce around between 0 0.333 and 0 0.667. And if I were to change this to four, it'll sound bad because I'll have a, a layer that's not actually plain. Now you're going to see it broken into 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. That's what the quantized values are going to come out. Okay. All right, so it's that simple. We're just, we're just quantizing the dice roll. Uh, the next thing that we have happening is now we're seeing, well, the problem is, and this was the problem I ran into in 2.5, this index selector is looking for integer values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, etc. It's not looking for 1.3 and 2.8, okay? It'll kind of respond to those by rounding up or down to the nearest integer, but that's not what we want. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this dice roll between 0 and 1, and I'm... Uh, multiplying the quantized values upward to turn it into even integers of like 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So in this case, with three layers, I'm turning 0 into 0, I'm turning 0.33 into 1, and I'm turning 0.667 into 2. So that would be layer 0, layer 1, and layer 2, right? So you can watch the... the uh, selector index values up here, and it's a simple multiplication of the number of layers mm. times the quantized value has taken place to create those uh, integer values. So watch this one. Okay, so basically once, once I have this last little calculation right here, these red lines coming out of here are all integer values that I can use to modulate the selector, and that I can then also do a couple additional things to in order to modulate these faders at the same time that the selector has changed. So I, I've got one LFO, one kind of set of random grid-locked values that are modulating both this and the faders. So let's talk about how we're doing the faders now. The way that I'm modulating the selector index right here, this top thing, is I just take this, you know, integer output from this guy, and <clears throat> I use a modulator out, and you can see when I hover over it, it's, it's highlighting this thing, and it's basically just sending 0, 1, or 2 to this, which is selecting between 0, 1, and 2 for the layers. If I were to kick this thing up to 4, or 5, or 10, or 8, or 11 layers, it would Again, spit out the correct integer and come all the way down here and pick whichever layer I wanted, okay? Let's go back down to three for now. Okay, so how I'm handling the faders is by uh, a couple, couple different uh, 
processes that are very simple to understand. Don't let this confuse you. So I'm taking the same integer output, the 0, 1, 2 in this case, right? And I'm, I'm basically doing a comparison. This is a logic comparison. I'm saying, is the value that's coming out of you know, my modulators, my LFOs, is the value greater than 7? And the reason I ask that is because of the way that I'm using these select devices, which are a type of mixer. I'm basically saying, take a given signal, and depending on some trigger value that's defined by this blue input here, I'm saying, take a signal that's coming in, and depending on a trigger, send it to any one of these eight possible outputs. There's eight in total that you can fit into one of these select devices. So I wanted to build a grid that I could expand up to 16 layers. I wanted to have a, 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 the ability to make a 16-layer Hocket device, and I could make it larger, but in reality, I could see myself sometimes wanting more than eight different synths in a Hocket, but I'm probably almost never going to use more than 16, right? So I don't think I need any more than 16, so I just built this out to give me 16 potential layers. And right now I'm only using the first three. So I'm comparing the value that's coming out to a constant of 7, and all that basically says is I'm using a selector here to say, well, if, if the value that comes out from this, this thing here is above 7, I want to flip it over to this output and send it over to this select bank. But if it's below 7, if it's 0 to 7, I want it to go to this select bank and come out here. And then each one of these select banks is just going to fader 1, fader 2, fader 3, all the way through fader um, 16 in, in a selector device. So again, I'm only using three layers. So the way that this works out is it's going to evaluate to less than 7. It's going to be shipped over to this first selector. And because the values are always 0, 1, or 2, you're going to see this little yellow dot bounce around between the first three layers. Okay, it's never going to exceed three because that's, you know, all these numbers by the time it gets over here is determined by this value here, my total number of layers. So, I don't have any like audio signal coming in here. Normally you'd use this as a kind of mixer, a kind of switcher to send a, an audio signal to different places inside the grid or outside the grid. In this case though, I'm not bringing any audio in. I'm just giving it a constant value of one. It's like, a, it's like a, a CV signal with a power of one. Um, so it's just a, a, a value of one. And then depending on where this yellow dot is, it's gonna trigger the corresponding modulator out with a signal that is a value of one, okay? And in this case, it just works out that if I hover over this fader number three, watch this lane right down here. See how um, that white and blue kind of background thing, it indicates that this, this modulator is gonna push the fader up from negative infinity at the bottom here it's going to push it up to basically right where you see it now, which is 0 dB. Okay, so that's the 0 dB mark, and that's what this distance from negative infinity up to there is exactly a power, a, a modulator value of 1. So if we actually look at the value of this modulator over here in the inspector panel on the left, we can see that I'm using this modulator to modulate this volume fader with a strength of one. And that, because I'm feeding in one and I'm modulating with strength of one, it basically pushes this up by a value of one, which is exactly the distance between negative infinity and zero dB. Very straightforward, very basic. Didn't, didn't take any experimentation really to figure this out. So <clears throat> um, that's all that's going on here is, is the same exact signal that I'm sending over to the index selector is also being fed over into these select racks. And a quick comparative thing is saying which integer value are you, and then depending on 
if it's integer two, it's gonna go here and it's gonna modulate fader three up from negative infinity to zero dB. And that's how you do it. You just build a device like this. And now if I wanted to expand this out, like if I wanted to add a fourth layer, uh, and let's put a thorn synth in here because it's lightweight and loads up quick. Let's just pick some random base preset. Sure, why not you? Okay. Um, so now I have a fourth synth in here, and all I would have to do is two things. Come over here and change my number of layers to four, and then come over here, find my fourth output fader, and come over here and drag this down to negative infinity first, and then grab the fourth modulator, drag this up a little bit. And it's rather than sit here and fish around and try and get a perfect 1.0 with your mouse, it's easier to just grab any positive value and then let go and come over here to the inspector panel and double click the number and just type in one. And now that's a perfect one output. I click this to stop that and now it's assigned and now this hocket will jump between four sounds and you'll see the yellow dot occasionally falling down here and modulating this one. And it's all random, so I can't predict when it happens. Come on. You can do it. There we go. See, when you're using randomness, <laughs> the more things you add to it, of course, the less predictable anything will be. So you can see it was that simple to add a fourth layer. And I could, I could keep adding layers all the way out to 16. This device will handle that just fine. So uh, hopefully this has been informative. If you've never seen the grid before in Bitwig, maybe it's taught you a little bit about the grid. Um, maybe it's piqued your interest because Ableton has nothing like this, and it's just amazing. I mean, you don't have to know anything. You can come in here and start dragging in oscillators and delays and filters and start creating really crazy sounds right off the bat. Like, you know, everyone's all gaga right now over Phase Plant by Kilohertz. And don't get me wrong, Phase Plant is awesome, and I have it, and I love it but phase plant is still baby steps compared to something like the grid. And with these oscillators and with the, the basic array of filter types we have, uh, you can build nasty, nasty sounding things in the grid, right? As well as very sweet sounding things. Uh, it's, it's like phase plant squared and then some on top of it. So if you're, if you're starting to feel constrained by serum, and massive and FM8 and you know all the classic synths that everyone uses that only do a few things but do them really well and you want to have a little more flexibility and your brain is starting to think modular uh, then that's just another reason to start looking really closely at Bitwig because Bitwig is just when 3.0 drops they have surpassed Ableton Able, they have left Ableton in the dust. Ableton has nothing like this that's as user-friendly and as easy to work with and as easy to experiment with. So there you go. I guess this is number 25 in my series, and it's kind of back on uh, the subject of Ableton versus Bitwig. And, you know, a year after I started making these videos, I think the case for Bitwig is even stronger than before. So thanks for hanging with me, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.